And I wanted to welcome you to the Department of Forestry's first Forest Paths Distinguished Speaker event. My name is Richard Covey, and I'm chairperson of the Department of Forestry. And uh, this offering by the Department of Forestry is going to occur twice per year, one time per semester. We're going to bring in a distinguished speaker. The idea behind this new series is uh, really a few things behind it. One is to cover a contemporary topic in forestry that's of broad interest. And at the same time, we want to uh, illustrate a successful career path to inspire current and future forestry students. The forest path analogy goes one step further in that the people that we're bringing in to give the talks are really leaders in forestry. And many of the thoughts and ideas that they share with us can point us to the future in forestry, both for the, for the profession as well as the, the discipline. So before I introduce today's speaker, I wanted to introduce uh, Dr. Ron Hendrick, who's the new dean of the College of Ag and Natural Resources. Ron earned uh, both a bachelor's and doctoral degree from MSU's Department of Forestry. And I'm pleased that Ron uh, accepted our invitation to make a few remarks here. after 24 years. This is yet another one of those new buildings that wasn't here when I was here. So it's like well, they put something. I've been in plants or a crop soil science building a lot. But um, so anyways, it wasn't too hard to find. Um, but it's great to be back here. Glad to be able to help uh, welcome my fellow alum uh, back to campus. This for the inaugural fourth pass um, seminar. Um, and um, I think we're in for a very good talk tonight. Looking forward to that. And um, again, very happy for me to be back here, um, providing some leadership and some service to the institution and the department that's done so much for me. So thank you. The idea for the speaker series arose from the Department of Forestry's advisory board and I'm going to ask the members of the advisory board to stand now, and I'm asking you to stand for a couple of reasons. So advisory board members, please rise. <laughs> I should have you stay standing, if you don't mind. No? <laughs> so I, I'm asking you to stand for two reasons. One is to really thank you, to thank you publicly for the generosity of your ideas and in your time in making MSU's Department of Forestry a, a great place. Um, we really appreciate that. And I know I can speak on behalf of the faculty and students in, in thanking, thanking you for that. The other reason why I want you to stand is because I want um, our current forestry students and perhaps future forestry students to see how, who you are. And I'm going to encourage our students to talk with these people informally at the reception that we'll be holding immediately afterwards in, in the atrium. Um, they all have had great successful careers. They're giving back. They, they offer great advice. Get to know them. All right? So with that, you can, you can sit down. So a few more thank yous. Uh, Gina D. Allen, Gina D., are you in the room? Oh, <laughs> so JD did a great job in, in organizing this event. Thank you so much, JD. And we wanted to thank Universal Forest Products and Mike Mordell for sponsoring the reception that will follow the presentation. So, Mike. 
And uh, incidentally, Mike Mordell will be the second speaker in this series that will occur on March 20th in the spring. And I also want to thank the MSU Forestry Club for helping to publicize this event. So MSU Forestry Students Forestry Club, can you stand? All right. Thank you. So finally, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. David Cleves, who currently is an independent consultant on risk management, leadership development, and climate change, especially to natural resource organizations. Uh, Dr. Cleves was previously the climate change executive and advisor on climate change issues to the US Forest Service. So he was the point person for the Forest Service on anything related to climate change. In his career with the US Forest Service, he served as deputy administrator of the agency's research division. And uh, the US Forest Service's research division is the largest forest-based research organization in the world. So it was um, really quite uh, an organization that he helped lead. He also served as director of the Rocky Mountain Research Station. In the interest of time, you can read more details about uh, Dr. Cleves in the program booklet, but I'm really proud to state that he earned both his bachelor's and his master's degrees from MSU Forestry. He's been a great role model in leadership, and he's a terrific and insightful member of our advisory board, and I look forward to hearing a great talk tonight. Thanks for everything, Dave. Cycles, and we can count on things. 
You know, we're always, we always count on like the ecological succession. We're always going to count on patterns. I've got a 1936 book from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, oh, my, my alma mater in my career, uh, about the climate. It's a great big yearbook of agriculture, and it really sent the message that we know what's going on with the climate. That's the one thing that we know, and we have regional guides and all this. Well, think again. So I think we have to kind of continually adjust our relationships between forests and people. And then how do we prepare ourselves for the next 50 years? Because you all will be working out over 20, 30, 40 years, unless you're really economist and you become rich, and then it may be 20 years, but whatever. And I wish you the best on that. So, um, so we got two trends that have occurred in the past century and will continue in the next century for a while anyway, is they have more forest than we've had in a long time. And it's growing much faster than it's being removed. That presents a lot of opportunities. On the carbon side, it presents some great opportunities because we have carbon, we have forest now that are sequestering and offsetting 15% of the total greenhouse gas emissions of the total economy, all the sectors, coming from forest, forest and, and harvested wood products. That's a good thing. And we got a lot more people. And a lot more of those people, if you look at the green slice here, are living in urban areas. And that growth is not going to slow down. So we have, we have these two trends that are occurring into the future. And we have a different, I mean, it's hard, really, for people and forests to avoid one another anymore. As I, as I was flying into Lansing from DC, which is a joy in and of itself, okay, uh, you could just see forests in various forms and patches and sizes all over the landscape. Okay, intermixed with people, urban, suburban, urbanizing, exurbanizing, rural, you name it. So we have we have a great strategic asset here, and it looks much different than it did. Um, early in the century. And I can remember looking at pictures that my grandmother and grandfather had from early in the century, and it was hard to find the tree except then in, in the riparian zones or up on the hill. Michigan's got 20 million acres. Bill, I'm correct me on this. It's about 20 million acres uh, of forest, really well diversified across ownerships, state, federal, corporate private, family private, and that's a good thing because you have different ownerships and different objectives that really make quite a portfolio against all different kinds of changes in the rest of the forest. So Michigan, as a matter of fact, Michigan, as I look at the greenhouse gas inventory that we send, the, the U.S. sends to the United Nations um, framework on climate change, Michigan, in terms of Change, stock change, what we call it, the change in the forest from one inventory cycle to the next, is in the top five of the states of the whole, the whole country. They're really, it's really a, a positive thing. You, you've got a really strong resource here in, in Michigan itself. But as we talk about this intersection that you're going to be dealing in, and, and, and I must say that our discussions in the Forestry Advisory Board, and I really appreciate being on that board. It's a group of folks who really care about positioning MSU forestry for the future. Uh, a lot of our discussions are how do we help build those skill sets to manage those interactions between forest systems and social systems. Not just individual people, people to people, but actually systems as they come together. And that one system that's a new variable is the climate system. Is the climate and now it's, it's 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 changing. So what is it about climate change? And this was in it when I got into this climate change <laughs> advisor's job at the Forest Service, and, and never and that the first the lesson, first lesson you learn there is don't talk too much. Because if you talk too much, too long, and you're successful, they give you the job. <laughs> and so then as we waited about six years ago into the idea of how does the Forest Service, how do we get involved in the emerging big discussion about climate change, in this case in the Obama administration. Forests were not being talked about. We had to show up. 
so part of our job was to show up in those discussions and insert forests as a strategic, ecological, and other resource in that discussion. And then secondly, how do you start to incorporate considerations about climate change into the operations of a big agency? Forest Service is 35,000 people. We've got 150 national forests. We've got a research division, a state and private division, and international programs. It's a, it's, a, it's a big circus, okay? So how do you take climate change, and you don't just kind of sprinkle it in or sort of smatter it on. It's like you've got a big organization with all kinds of stovepipes, all kinds of expectation. It was an interesting kind of systems problem. So, but then we ran right into that kind of the unique issues and the unique attributes of climate change as an issue. We started a, a communication with the entire Forest Service employees, so they had 35,000 of them. Basically, we kind of broke the rules a little bit, but somebody filmed this. Anyway, so anyway, so they started communicating with us, and I, I still I saved some of the early notes I got from Forest Service employees. You might think, well, oh, they're really, they, they're into this climate change thing. Uh-uh. I mean, I, the, the day that I was told a communist radical hip, hippo, hippie free, I mean, I thought, well, you may have a communication issue here. <laughs> so, but, but as an issue, it's a unique issue because of its ubiquity. It's really ideological to be charged. It's kind of a label. If you say climate change in Washington, that means you belong to something, to some group, just one side or another. And uh, if you turn it around, and say, let's talk about the changing climate, you get a completely different discussion. So, so we had to kind of work through some of that. Uh, it's, it, it's, and the science community, I'm afraid, has, has not done as good a job as it could in communicating climate change because it always comes out very futuristic and very apocalyptic. Oh, the world, I mean, you know, I come into a room and the forest service, it was like pig bat walked into the room. You know, you got this cloud on you. So, oh, here comes the climate change guy again. He's going to tell us how bad the world is. So it, had, it, it takes some of that with it in, an, in, a, in, a, in the public agenda, and it's kind of embedded in lots of different terms that the climate science have had to develop to move the science forward. But when you move it into a public setting and public issues, you've got to translate that. So when you talk about adaptation and mitigation, what does that actually mean? To, to somebody uh, in, um, down the road who has a farm or a forest landowner or somebody on the street in Detroit. It has to be translated into their language. So it has some issues with it. And in an organization, it has another set of issues. It has to cut across the silos in an organization because everybody thinks in their silo in a big organization that they have a mission, they're doing that mission, and they solve that problem. So the fire people over here, the insect people over here, the disease people over here, the forest management people all have a kind of a domain of that organization. Along comes this thing that cuts across. So you have to do some dissolving and puncturing of silos. Um, and it's easy to defer because it's not urgent. It's not today's issue. You can always kind of let it go, unless you can ignite the champions that are in an organization. So we've got climate change. We've got a change in climate, I'll put it that way. We can argue about climate change later. And the evidence is mounting. And what, this is, these are Mich this is Michigan data. We have temperatures that are rising. What is it now? 15 of the 16 hottest years have occurred since 2000. Okay? So I think if we look at the evidence, you can't really deny that we don't have a, quote, changing climate. And if you look a little closer, you see in most cases, it's more variable. That's a big issue, <clears throat> if you're, especially if from, a, from an administrator's standpoint. If you're trying to keep somebody's attention, you need a solid, relatively consistent signal. If you tell them that this is a really hot year and this is an example of what you're going to see more of, and then the next year is the coldest year in the next 10 years, it's very difficult to keep public or policy attention. So the more you, we, we move forward, the more I get jitters about the variability as much as the, the increases or the changes here. But the point is, and I guess that's my little gimmicky part of the title here, is that there is, my apologies to Lake Wobegon, there is no new normal. 
The new normal is that there's no normal. That in the future, a lot of the assumptions and the data that we use to make judgments, for example, about where to put roads and how big of culverts and pipes to put under the roads, are based on actuarial data, on data from the past. In the future, we're going to have to make some adjustments in that because we're on, we're on the right, we're on the run. And the, the, uh, the reinsurance industry has found this out. They're starting to make bigger payoffs for these extreme events. <coughs> They've, they're starting to depend more or as much on modeling uh, of climate systems in the future as they do on their actuarial database. And I think we'll see more of that as we get into this area of new or no normal. Uh, lots of impacts, both positive and negative, of climate change, of changing climate on forests that are being brought out of the national climate assessments and other studies, many of which are done right here. And some of them are perhaps positive, some of them are negative. So we wait to see you know, how they play out and how they play out in different parts of the country. Whether it's having more CO2 in the air and having the trees take advantage of it, longer growing seasons, um, uh, precipitation events, drought, this is a big issue in the wet. Basically what, what we deal with is that the wet gets wetter and the dry gets drier. And as you see that play out, in the country, you see two much different sets of impacts on forest systems in the east and in the west. And if we even talk about things like carbon sequestration, we'll actually see that the north and the south, the eastern part of the United States, is a relatively uh, more active uh, sequestration machine than the west. Many of our western forests, and we have four states now that are actually sources of carbon dioxide emissions because of drought, insect disease, and other climate-driven impacts here. So, and um, whether it's drought, whether it's um, rain, we're seeing that packed more into extreme events. Here's a look at the lake states and the frequency of three in of three inch and greater rainstorms over the past 60 days. So, a, a one in a hundred year rainstorm what used to be, is now a one in 30 year rainstorm. And if you're going to build culverts under roads, and the Forest Service has 350,000 miles of roads, they're all over the place. So how do you prioritize that recalculation of the peak loads that went into the designs of those roads as they come up for repair and replacement? That's one of the big jobs that our engineers have to deal with. It's a, it's a big decision process that it's a recalculation of the of the standards that they use. And it's all about really shifting the distribution of events. And it doesn't, when, we, when someone says that, well, the temperature has increased 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit in the last 100 years, that just tells a part of the story. What the, the real action part is down at the end of the distribution. Those of you who, who remember or choose to remember uh, statistics, you know, I, I remember many, many days in statistics class at OSU. Actually, some of it was pretty interesting, but it was it's what we call frequentistic or classical statistics. It wasn't about Bayesian statistics and decision science statistics and all those. But anyway, it's the extreme events that kill us. In fire, for example, you know, um, maybe 5% of the events account for 75% of the loss and the cost. So the action is down in the tail, so to speak. So what climate change is doing is shifting the tail of these events down towards the extreme. And you see it in, you see it in the data. Uh, and at the same time, you see the, kind of the coupling of different kinds of what we call risks together, all driven by climate change. So when we talk about climate change as an accelerator and now a coupler, it's these complexes and combinations of things that actually drive the changes that we're worried about. What are the implications? The implications are that we can no longer afford to look at kind of one risk at a time. We've got to look at systems and we have to be able to evaluate those systems and the impacts of those systems on biological and, and human systems. Um, this again comes out of the National Climate Assessment and all of the dials on the um, ecological dashboard are all starting to go up 
they're all beginning to be even more correlated. Here's a look at drought in southwest forests. It's not just drought, it's hot drought. So we haven't had this combination of drought and heat combined in just centuries. They tell me that it's contributing to folks coming. So, and the dashboard, the indicators are starting to show that, whether it be mortality in, in forest or infestation or burned area, they're all going up at the same time. So they're all kind of ganging up on certain forest ecosystems. So you have to deal with a, with a one, two, three, and four punch. It's not any longer just a single issue. Uh, and probably the, the one issue that most typifies the impact of climate change, and it's never just climate change by itself, it's always climate change in connection with other things, and that's why the fire. So here's a look at just what you were seeing in those, those graphs, is that actually the number of fires has gone down over time. The acres burned and the severity of those fires has gone up. And it is, it is spawn, I mean, basically what we have right now, we have uh, an average of six million acres a year, and you got the development of an entire, basically, a fire industrial complex. I can say that now because I don't work for the agency. I officially <laughs> fired myself. <laughs> so, but uh, it's double jeopardy. I mean, you know, again, it fired twice, I don't think. <laughs> uh, but, but you, it, it's a serious organizational issue, we'll show in a second. And it also typifies that what over time we're wrestling with in climate change is you get more and more of your investment, human investment, dollars, emotion, whatever, oriented towards protection versus production. This is what, when you start developing whole industries around protection, yeah, you stay protected, but how productive can you be? What kind of new thing can you create? This, this, this bothers me. It still bothers me. I should be, I mean, I, I thought I retired, but I'm still bothered, okay? So we got, and this is all over the place. And it's, it's not just about structures, it's about ecosystems, it's about getting back in the carbon game, it's about smoke and human health, it's a, it's a, it's a big deal. And it has, it, it, it's all about not just forest. I mean, we, Washington is a, is a wonderful place to work. And I hope somebody else works there. <laughs> but the part of it is if we can find something to blame in a simple way, that's great. But in this case, you know, we've got six million acres of burn. Part of it is a year. Part of it is due to a changing climate. And a lot of the more recent what's called attribution studies point that out. But maybe 20 to 30 percent, maybe, and I'll make a bet there, of the increase in burned acres has a climate signal. So there's a climate piece there. There's also a vegetation piece. You get a lot of aggressive fire suppression down through the years, a lot of, you know, veget these trees do what trees do. If you leave them alone, they grow. And they really grow quite, quite rapidly, more rapidly than we think. And they don't necessarily grow kind of where we want them. So we've got this tremendous vegetation uh, situation out there. And then we got all kinds of folks who live in the urban interface. And in the West in particular, we've looked at housing growth on the fringes within 50 miles of the National Forest boundary versus the average housing growth throughout the country, and it's like two or three times. In other words, it's a great place to live. We're going to locate there. The same places that I look at to locate a house in the wildlands, if I'm looking at it as a fire, if a fire had personality, it's a great place to burn. So we have this tremendous people, forest, climate interaction issue here, and all, at least maybe the climate thing in the long run is manageable, but certainly the human and the vegetation piece is manageable, but there's just so much of it. Uh, and people can do something about this by how they treat their home setting. And that's what this tries to, to um, illustrate, is that the place is really burned over. That house is not. That house went through a whole set of firewise improvements. So that, that fire burned right through there, but didn't burn the house, because a lot of the fires propagate mainly by cinder showers ahead of the fire, not just one big mass flame. So there are, there are opportunities there, but here's a 
kind of a complex slide, but it's, it's, it's a look at where the situation that the Forest Service is in now. That 50 some, 50, 52% 50, 2014, I think it's 53% now. And that, and that of the Forest Service budget is devoted to fire management. Okay, and most of that is fire suppression. Okay, so that has, first of all, organizationally, we are gravitating to a professional fire service in the agency that was more broadly a natural resource agency. And it still is, but there are certain donors to that. We don't have we don't have the fire program set up using good insurance principles. And I think the the concepts of insurance, not commercial insurance necessarily, but the concept of the government as an insurer of last resort and, and some of the insurance functions of the government is going to have, we're going to have to look at those more closely because what we have in finance and fire is an insurance structure that doesn't fit the problem. So where do you have, where do you take the dollars to fund this fire program? You take them from your other resource program. So there's a big opportunity cost. So all those jobs and all that activity in these other areas that would have been, have been feeding the fire program because you're really self-insured and you're taking it out of your operating funds. It doesn't make sense. So we're, this is just the first of the kinds of issues that I think that we'll see as the rate of change in climate increases. Fire is kind of a bellwether on this thing. We can learn from fire. Uh, and there are lots of other economic and social implications of climate change we all had in your classes, but there are also opportunities here with carbon markets and, and, and the idea of a restoration economy. So the second the important part, I think, I, I think, of our discussion tonight is how the forest fit in as a solution. So we can talk about the impacts of climate change on forests, but forests have a tremendous opportunity. Forests and wood products have a tremendous opportunity to help us do something about it. And sometimes we don't list those. I mean, part of our whole objective in dealing with administration and Council of Environmental Quality and all kinds of other folks in D.C. is to get this message across that forests are part of the solution. So sustainable wood products, when we, when we harvest wood and we put it in a building or in a panel or in a table, that carbon stays there. It stays there for 80, 100 years or more. And uh, so it's a way of extending the work that the tree did to get it in that form and live in it at the same time. It's a pretty good deal, I would say. And, we, and given some of the new techniques that, that are being developed for actually building up, uh, building uh, taller structures with wood and being able to be part of the sustainability options in urban areas, I think even extends that even more. But there are lots of other carbon sequestration. You talked about forests being a, quite a carbon sequestration source. Nobody, very few forest and forest owners are paid for that. The government tells us that the social cost of carbon is about $36 a ton. Lots of arguments about that, but inside the government, those, those are the figures that we use. So if you value just the carbon sequestration buffering that the forest of the United States, about 754 million acres provide, we're talking about 30 billion a year. Just, and none of that's, none of that's paid for. Very little of it. In California's program is just growing, it's just developing a market for that. Uh, but also the role of forest in urban adaptation. I looked on the, I, I did a little research on the number of cities in Michigan that have adaptation plans and programs, and I think there are like 23, something like that. And how many of those actually have trees and forests as part of their adaptation plan would be my question. I couldn't, I couldn't find that. And it's, Michigan's not unique uh, unless you make a special effort. Sometimes cities don't really think about trees as elements of adaptation adapting to extreme events and other impacts of climate change. So lots of good research that shows that if you have trees, you've got a cooling resource, 
and heat island effects of climate change in urban areas are quite important. Stormwater management uh, under extreme events, Baltimore has got a whole program on adaptation that they have included forest in, and they've developed all kinds of riparian tree plantings inside the city to kind of slow down the flashiness of these extreme events. Uh, Agroforestry, habitat protection, and even ups and downs of bioenergy. So there's a whole set of, of <coughs> possibilities there that where forest and forestry can be uh, involved in adaptation. I'm involved in a group in the Washington area, and that's called the Forest Climate Working Group. It's a coalition of about 25 organizations, NGOs, and our our mission is to get forests put into any sets of future policies on climate change. And our basic strategy is it's all about policies that retain forests as forests, restore forest health, reforest areas that need to be, and we're getting behind in our reforestation because we're having so many extreme events and we can't catch up with that, whether it be east or west. And we do that by creating markets. The government can't do it all. And, and, there are, and you have to develop some kind of a market approach where you use the sustainable wood products and you develop markets for carbon in one way or another, whether it be a carbon tax, whether it be a cap and trade. There has to be a way to get a signal to landowners that if they manage better, there's some kind of a reward in it. And we have not been successful on that at a national scale yet, but we, we hope to be in the future. Um, and then the last thing is priorities. You can't do it all everywhere. And there was a tendency in um, climate change, especially in the early days, a lot of well-intentioned people kind of went in all different directions. It's kind of like everybody go out for a pass and do what you can. Okay? And you can't do that because there are lots of other competing uses for dollars. So how do you set priorities? How do you triage areas? How do you choose the right strategy? How do you manage risk in the right, right way? So here's four, four uh, I guess say prospects that I would recommend as we go forward, and you may give some consideration to it as you're developing parts of your curriculum or your, your experience here or getting prepared for it. One is we need to be able to manage connected risk, not one risk at a time, but the connections in the, in the systems that we talk about, and treat groups of what we call stressors as one. Any company has some kind of an enterprise risk management program where they look at what, is, what are all the factors that are going to influence our ability to, to meet our mission, and how do they combine, and what are we going to do about it, and how do we set priorities. And that's basically what we need to do rather than getting so piped around individual risk. So risk management, I think, is one of the uh, important sets of skills for the, for the future. And secondly, we need to build capacity to change the very institutions that we're part of. And, and you, you know, if you've got an institution that's been the same way for 100 years, or 50 years, or 40 years, and you're facing the kind of changes that we are here, it's not a good bet to think that we're just going to keep doing the same thing on into the future. This, was the, this has been the interesting experience that I've had in the Forest Service, even right now in the structure of the Forest Service. It's uh, like all organizations, I would call it uh, highly viscous at times. Very difficult to, to, to move and change for, for good, good reason. But to be able to do that, you have to, you have, to have leadership. Here's a kind of a quick look. One history of climate change in the forest service. And, and so through four decades. So you say, you've been thinking about this stuff for four decades. Actually, it goes beyond that, about 50 years. It takes a while. You, know. it's a, uh, you don't just microwave climate, climate change into, into being. And only in the recent years, in, in the, actually in the tens, have we defined climate change as a management issue. It's kind of been boiling. It's been part of the science agenda. There's been lots of talk about it. It's an interesting coffee table thing. Uh, scientists in particular, and that's why it's important for the Forest Service to have a good R&D program, been kind of the headlights have, of the organization, have been telling us about these changes that were coming. But uh, when one of our former chiefs, Dale Bosworth, <coughs> decided uh, during 
Bush administration, uh, the George W. Bush administration, to give a talk at Berkeley and define climate change as the number one management issue of the future, there were some interesting changes. That was rather courageous. And he, um, he had sent his speech over to the White House for approval. And they said, sounds good. Sounds great. It's kind of surprising because he was expecting he was going to get pushed back on. But it was really all about wrestling with climate change in rational ways. It wasn't that they were denying the uh, change in climate. It was about how you handle it. And so well, he ushered in a whole set of motions here that we that we developed into a whole program for climate change. Now this is the objective of this slide is basically to show you that this is a whole organization in motion. This is the Forest Service. This is a performance scorecard that we developed around uh, all these 10 elements of what we thought was a, was a solid approach to integrating climate change. The whole objective of this was to get the organization's attention. And, and we, as we built it into the performance evaluation process, all of our senior executive service directors and the people that reported to them have to, and still do, have to report to the progress they made in the scorecard. So the first, the first three items are really all about building capacity by training people and, and doing a better job of coordination and developing better policy. The second part is about engagement in your IP. You have partnerships in place that you can do and use. The fourth um, part, section of this, Three sections are really about have you assessed the risk and the vulnerability? And I know you, you have plans to do something about it. And the last two are about how are you managing the carbon, the carbon in the forest, and your emissions footprint. In other words, sustainable operations. So the sustainability, what we know and sustainability, and a lot of programs is in that 10 item here. So you can see that they've made progress over the last five years. My, my objective when we get, got this started was to um, go five years and turn it over to the next group. So my job was to work my way out of the job. And I probably did that. <laughs> so, because I believe in term limits, especially my own. So, but the, the idea was that coming on behind us was a whole group of really excited and exciting young people who would use this framework and carry it on further. And I think, and I think that's, that's happened. They've changed their scorecard some, and that's exactly what I wanted to happen. I didn't want to hang in there. You know, we wanted to purposely turn, turn this over. Some of the things that we didn't have going, the carbon assessment. National Forest, what do you need carbon? You want us to manage the National Forest for carbon? Not, not I, not us. So that was a real an issue. How do you build that in? So we actually had to provide the National Forest with baseline assessments of how much carbon is in the forest that they manage what, what are the changes and, how, and what would you do about it, if anything? So as we look at hiring people in the federal government, we use a number of sets of frameworks. And under the climate change, Obama's climate change plan, part of this was, well, how would you, how would you refine the criteria that we use to not just hire, but also to develop people so that they reflect some consideration of climate change. And not redo it, but just integrate it. So these are the four. Any Anytime we um, promote somebody, whether it's into a top leadership position or even down the way, we use the OPM uh, executive core qualifications. So how would you change them? So, uh, and not, so let's look at one of them, leading change. Of all the different competencies, we offered to the, uh, the administration from the Forest Service a set of refinements that might make that criteria a little more climate friendly. So you might want to look at, at these and look at some of the work that the Association of Climate Change Officers, which is a new group that's done. They've played this out in great, much greater detail. But really, it's all about <coughs> Decision science is how do you use forecasts in uncertainty? You don't just eat them whole. You don't believe them. You know, and models are really about insight more than they are prediction. 
So how do you actually use those in decision processes? And how do you understand your own decision processes? There's a, been a whole developing work field of decision sciences here that we need to be able to tap if we're going to be introspective about our decision processes going forward. Enterprise risk management, social implications, and um, the idea that, that you're going to have to motivate and measure people in organizations that already have a mission and are already headed forward. It's a little different twist on leading change, but you might want to look at those when I we bring people into the Forest Service early, or they have scientists who wanted to move into management, we would use these criteria and from the beginning write out where they were in that career. Some of them had lots and lots of blanks, and then we use that as a career development tool. So uh, it's, it's, um, it's an important piece of how we look at uh, people and how we grow people. Uh, third challenge I, I see is how do we make the science, the application, how do we make innovation work faster? Uh, when I was at Rocky Mountain Research Station, I, I, I delighted in calling the scientists together from time to time. And I'd always tell them that their job was not just science. And I just stopped. And then I'd get these boos and you know, interesting, you know, respectful comments. <laughs> but the, the object was the object was that it's really about science-based innovation. It's not just about the science. The science is necessary but not sufficient. So how well do we manage this application cycle? Do we stop as an organization in research after we found a problem? Or do we invest in all the other things that we need to do to get it into adoption, get it scaled up? And it's surprising to me how little we invest, how little we pay attention to this whole cycle. We've got this old model of tech transfer in our heads, and really it's all about how do, we, how do we develop the right partnerships to get things in place and get them moving. And then the last challenge is how do we integrate different disciplines into solutions? And that's where I think your Michigan State, when I first came to Michigan State office, farm in Ohio, I hope we had seen my last corn stalk. <laughs> and I came, came to Michigan State, and the first thing I noticed about the place is this is big. I was in dire need of a tractor. You know, this was, this, I mean, this was, it's big, and I thought, well, this is a little, little scary. But actually, as you come to be here, you say that's part of its advantage. It's big, it's diverse, there's lots of places, lots of disciplines you can pull on and go to and connect with as a true university to develop those skills to manage interdisciplinary um, teams, if you will. So I think it's, it's got a, we've got a great faculty, research facilities, great, great alumni, and we're at the forestry board, we're trying to get reconnected to our forestry alumni and kind of bring them into a more vibrant network. Um, sustainability programs, um, lots of partnerships, and it's a land-grant university. And I, I was on the faculty at Oregon State for a number of years, and I had an extension appointment in addition to teaching and research, and became very uh, embodied in the model of taking science out into where it should be, where people can use it. And so I always kind of carry that with me. So any land-grant system I go to as a new you're not using that the potential in that mission and that authority, you need to. You need to keep going back. So here's my last my last raw here. As I look back at my time here, there were some lessons that I started to learn. I didn't learn them here. There were times when my mind was on other things. Okay. <laughs> but they stuck with me and I kind of learned added learning to them back in the years. And they really come from not just the courses that I took at Michigan State Forestry Department, but the faculty. And uh, the kind of connection that the faculty had with not just the material, but I mean, you know, you're, you're, you're young, you're, you're coming to a, a big place. The faculty kind of models behavior, models attitudes. Here. So as I look down through things that I still use today, Number one, it's about systems. It ain't about some idiosyncratic event 
that happens. If you're going to think through it, you've got to use the principles of system, whether it's a business system or a human system or an ecological system. They're all kind of similar kinds of principles, and you can start to bring solutions together. Everything is a business. Maybe not a commercial business, maybe not private sector, but if you're a university, your dentist office, your uh, um, uh, forest landowner, uh, your church, it's a business. And you've got to learn that business and how to make it operate We're on top of the technical um, expertise that you bring to it. And sci thirdly, science is not just about facts. It's about more than that. It's not just for scientists. It's really about solutions and connections. And uh, sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we say, well, if we just get the science together and we put science in the middle uh, of a debate, um, a solution will occur, a miracle will occur. Not so. And a lot of people need to have science interpreted into their framework. And sometimes we're not so good about that. We need to be good boundary spans. Okay, success comes from how you manage surprise. Is that um, an example is after the 2000 fire year, we had a lot of people who wanted to help on the congressional side. And there was a, the development of the national fire plan, which basically doubled the fire budget. We had a plan for fire research that we had available at the time that we've been working on for years. And at that time, in those congressional discussions, we were able to bump up the Forest Service research budget by $28 million overnight. Because we were there in that 15 minutes, even in that period of surprise. Because we had done some planning ahead of time. Fifth, to appreciate other disciplines, sooner or later you're going to need them. And you get into some, I know we get at Oregon State a little bit smitten. Well, that's what it's economists, and you expect that out of them. That's what the ecologists over there. You put somebody in a problem-solving situation, climate change related or not, they're going to have to work together. They're going to have to work together as a team. A lot of that comes from appreciation. And then solutions depend on how you frame the problem. We talked about changing climate and climate change. Washington, D.C. is an old cauldron of people who reframe the problem. Half of them never answer the question. And that's part of their strategy. But they're really good about changing the problem frame. What is, it, what is the measurement? What's the baseline? Who wins? Who loses? And so you have to be really kind of connected to that. When I was at Michigan State, I had the opportunity to basically minor in journalism. So it gave me a, a, an opportunity to kind of understand words and communication well enough so that today, when we sit down and talk with a media person, I kind of know what their job is about. I know what they're up against. I know a little bit better how they might be receiving something I send their way, which may or may not be decipherable and be technical. You know? So if you're kind of a governor of my relationships and my communication. So anyway, uh, so that's it for, for me. Uh, and I'm very happy to answer any questions or so. As far as forest paths go, there are not many, I don't see any signposts here. And that path may not as, be as well worn. It might divert out into the woods. And it might, those might not even be birches in the future. Excuse me, But there's still going to be multiple paths forward. So I, I, I thank Michigan State for giving me the opportunity some decades ago to start out on one of those paths. And, um, uh, it's been a, it's been quite a party actually, and still is. Yes, I thought it was better, but yes, not. So. <laughs> anyway, thank you. <laughs>